Um, so yeah, I was going to talk about my great disable, but that's a bit boring, and I didn't have a presentation until yesterday. Anyway, um, so I figured I'd do something else. Um, yeah, well, it is bad, and I can talk about it for a few minutes if you want later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've, I've been working on proxy execution on and off for a few years now, I think. Um, usually I get stuck and then give up and then get busy with other stuff. Um, this time it's stuck for a bit. Um, and I did it during the holidays and, and, and when I drive my daughter to ballet lessons and you know, the, the odd hour here and there. Um, so why proxy execution? Um, so we have the priority inheritance for the, for the FIFO and our other static priority schedulers. Um, before the job priority, we've got the deadline stuff. We've got deadline inheritance which sort of gets you there, but because of the CBS, we also need the bandwidth inheritance. Um, we might actually do that if this um, takes a little bit longer. It shouldn't be too hard now that I've fixed the, um, the, the, the crashes we had in there with, with Futex and RT Mutex. Uh, we have a stable um, top task pointer in the task struct. Um, so if we change the deadline accounting to use the top task um, state instead of current, it should be fairly trivial to make that lamp uh, or bandwidth inheritance uh, working. It shouldn't be too hard, but I've not done. And, and there is people um, doing um, priority inheritance on, on CFS. Um, like I think Binder, the Android people, they're doing absolutely crazy stuff. Um, but they're inheriting nice values and that's just plain wrong. It's just not, it's not proper. Um, but you see, for every scheduler, we, we need a different scheme, and that's, that's a bit iffy and unwieldy. Um, so some, you, hooray, this works. Um, so some people dreamt, uh, the Kurt, was it? At, at Dirk, uh, Dirk Niehaus at, at um, Kansas. He dreamt of proxy execution, and Thomas has been lobbying for that for many years. Um, ah, we actually had an implementation on UP. Yeah, well, on, on, on UP is, is simple. We get there. Um, <laughs> um, so it integrates the priority inheritance, or, or it's not really priority, with the scheduling function as such, because the scheduling function simply picks the most eligible task uh, to run at any one moment. Um, it does, however, split what we currently have as one task into two concepts. It's the scheduling context, that which the scheduler selects uh, on, and an execution context, which is basically the stack and the, the register state and all that stuff, the, the bits we, we actually let the CPU run on. Um, this is currently a bit intermingled in, in just struct task, but conceptually we, we can pull this apart into separate issues. Um, another thing that is very different from um, regular um, priority inheritance and all that is, is that we keep the blocked on mutexes, and this is a distinction, an important distinction, only if you block on mutexes do you stay runnable? You, you stay on the run queue. You don't actually get pulled off. Um, so yeah, I, I gave it a go again. So let me see where's the e, light. So very simply, we, 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 this is schedule, picking a new task. So it used to be just next is pick next task and off we go. Um, we, we add the proxy thing, that is the one we initially pick, the, the schedule context from the task. Um, and if the, the next one is blocked on a mutex, we walk the blockchain. And then we'll get to that in a bit later. So then, then we get next and the proxy function is basically here, follow block on and from the blocked on, which is the mutex, we find an owner and off we go. Seems simple, right? Trivial to do. Of <sighs> don't work. Um, so if it's, and this this was the case some years ago before I rewrote mutex the last time, um, we had a fast path on mutex, which set an atomic log variable in the fast path. We have a good we done. Um, and then another mutex comes in. It sees it logs and it goes into this slow path and there it blocks, but. This is interleaved such 
that at this point where we need an owner, there is no owner set yet. So there is a number of constraints on mutex implementations. One of them is that the fast path or anything that claims the mutex as owned also needs to provide an owner. You can either do this with a big state and a spin lock, or you just use um, the owner pointer as the content of your atomic word, which is what the current mutex implementation actually does, so yay for me. Um, optimistic spinning is another thing we, we added to um, mutexes. Is another thing you obviously cannot do if you want a proxy execution. Um, because your higher priority blocking task shouldn't go spin and sit there and idly wait for the mutex. You want it to contribute or, or boost the priority of the one you're waiting on. So we need to get back on that run queue in order to, to boost. Um, if the task selection here does not pick the highest eligible task, it does not follow this and the actual owner will not get to run earlier. So no optimistic spinning. And, and this is new, it must set the block tone relation, otherwise there is nothing to follow. So, Peter? yeah? I mean, optimist, uh, optimistic spinning is because the owner's running. So technically you don't need to boost it because it's on the CPU already. Yeah, but on SMP this gets tricky. I guess it just but kills the rest yeah, of the Yeah, it more I mean, complex, we, can, I we can look later, but um, it, it got very tricky to make this work, so I killed it. But we, we can, I mean, if we ever get this, we, we can look at adding some of it back in. Um, so here we get the atomic owner thing, and, and off we go, we must be good. But earlier on, I said we only stay on the run queue if you're blocked on the mutex. The corollary is that you can be blocked on anything other than a mutex. There's the, the weight variables, uh, the condition things, and just your schedule, uh, the, um, the, the sleep stuff. You can just go off the run queue for whatever odd, odd reason. Um, so we need to deal with that because what happens if the owner of the mutex you're boosting is not on the run queue? Then you happily select a task to go run that is not in fact runnable. It's not a pretty situation. So we need to deal with that. So the solution that we came, or Rekai came up with is to simply enqueue everything that ends up selecting a non-runnable task on that task itself. You just tear them all off the run queue and, and put them in a list. So here we go. If we find an owner that is not runnable, jump out and, and here, we do another new thing, we keep back pointers, we, we create a stack. So if we traverse the chain, we create back pointers so we can find where we came from. And we go back up and all the tasks that we found in the boost chain, put on a list and take off the run queue and return null. Um, where did I put that? Oh yeah, here it is. So if we return null, we try again. We just store a whole bunch of tasks from the run crew, those are not eligible to run anymore, and off we go. So, but this means that on wake up, when we do wake a task, we need to iterate that list we just built and put all those tasks back on the run queue. It's not too difficult. And this is the regular blockchain thingy, and this works. This is UP, this boots. It's not too hard. Like Thomas said, we had it on UP. It's brilliant. Yeah. So this point wasn't too hard, getting here. Um, there is this one little hiccup with the mutex though. Um, so our current mutex does handoff. Um, if we have a blocked on task, which is the back pointer that we had uh, from the stack, then that is the task that boosted us and that's the highest priority task that is waiting for this resource. So we should hand off to this one. However, this can be no, and this is something that I have not actually solved or know what to do about. Um, if we have our three tasks, the high priority, medium priority, and low priority tasks, um, the high priority gets there first and it acquires the resource. And then the low priority one blocks 
and after that the medium priority blocks, then if the high priority task releases, block task is zero because it did not need boosting. In this case, we fall back to FIFO, which means that the first blocker gets it, which is in this instance the low priority task. Um, if we want to order that waitlist, we need to reproduce a scheduling function, which is the exact thing we wanted to avoid. Um, so yeah, that's icky. Also, um, if we do the handoff and we give it to somebody that boosted us, we must of course reschedule the moment that we've broken this chain so that the higher priority task can acquire the resource and get on with work. Um, so yeah, so far so good. And even on UP, there's a little hiccup that I'm not quite sure what to do with. Um, yeah, SMP. And, and if only this were easy, because like Thomas said 10 years ago, we had the UP thing running. Um, so we had the unlock. No, no, I know. We, we should disable and, and delete all the config SMP code and, and yeah. go back to UP. Yeah, I know. Somehow I might see some... <sighs> Some people objecting to that idea. <laughs> I mean, we can't even delete all 32-bit code, which would be awesome to do. Um, so yeah, on SMP, we can have our proxy chain-following thing race against an unlock on another CPU. Um, this can result in the owner you select being a task that has just been freed, which is generally a bad thing. It can also be you, which is a fun case. And I'll get to the exact case later on. Um, you can also race against wake-ups because as we've shown, we had this list for wake-ups. If you block on a block task, or if you try to boost a block task, you get, book, uh, you get put on a list. And then on wake-up, we do them all. You don't want a task to go missing there. A task that thinks it's blocked itself there, but then the other task thinks it just woken up and you end up with a task that is just not there anymore. Um, been there, done that, it's not good. And you sit staring at your machine, why don't it move? That task went missing. Um, and then there is the whole affinity thing. Um, the obvious example is one task running on two CPUs, or even three or four. This is a fairly bad situation to be in. That gives very creative crashes. Um, the reason for this to happen is that if you have multiple higher priority tasks, one on CPU 1, one on CPU 2, one on CPU 3, all blocked on that same resource, which is owned by the one task, and all these CPUs will traverse this blockchain and end up with the same runnable task and schedule it on different CPUs. It's not a good thing. Um, so. I can't remember. I'm sure I've seen a lot of it when I was working on this. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, the idea is to, when you traverse the blockchain and you see that you've just crossed to another CPU, stop your traversal and migrate your entire chain up to that point towards the CPU that you see your next owner to be on. Um, and then there's people, but what if my task has an affinity on that one CPU we're on? Well, it's a block task, and block tasks don't have affinity. The affinity is for the code you run, for the execution part. If we blocked, we don't run code, so that's okay. <laughs> we can break affinities <laughs> if we're not running. <laughs> right, if, if we're not there. Does it, does it make a move, uh, sound? Yeah, so block tasks have no affinity. Um, so the first thing, which is the mutex unlock race, is not that hard to fix. Um, the mutex, if it is contended, will go through the slow path and will acquire the weight lock for unlock. So if we take it over our traversal, the unlock will wait for us. 
And that means either the unlock has already happened, in which case this one can happen, or it'll wait for us and give us the guarantee that the owner we see will still be around, which is a nice thing to have. Um, if we are the owner, or, or the current iteration in our descent, then that's awesome. We can just complete the wake up, and we'll get to there later, and start running it. Also not too hard. Um, let me see, the, the race against the wake ups, also not too hard. We add another lock. Um, so here we have four locks nested already. I'll not bore you with those details. Um, we add a lock around the block list. Um, then there is the obvious situation that, um, yes, we acquired the lock, but meantime, the other guy did this. It did the wake up, it iterated the list, and now we appear to be running again. Also not too hard, we jump back to the list iteration and not try again. So this, this also works. It's not so very difficult. Um, and this is where, so, and this is the last of the code because you can see the font is getting smaller and smaller. And I did not put the code that I have for the SMP bits in because that's just <laughs> horrific. Um, it boots, but that's about everything it does. I've not run anything other than booting on that. Um, so I'll, I'll try and describe some of this. Um, we need to migrate at the first CPU crossing. So if we traverse the chain, as soon as we see that the owner is on a different CPU, we need to migrate. Um, because the locking and all the other stuff only provide guarantees for the current CPU. If we were to cross over to another CPU, the locking doesn't guarantee stability of pointers and we're off in the woods. Ideally, you'd like to follow the chain all the way to the executable task and migrate everyone there. We can't do this, or at least I couldn't make it work. Um, so migrate at the first CPU crossing, and then all we can do is migrate towards the CPU that we see the other one being at, at that point in time. So we, we take the CPU number that is not us, then release all the locks so everything can move again. We, we unwind our stack, because we kept a stack pointer, put it on a list, shoot it over to the other CPU, and then back off and say, let's retry, see what happens. <laughs> um, so if that task, then, or the executable task, meanwhile, migrated to us, and then the other CPU will select, and it finds, oh, it's there, and it needs to shoot it all back over. So we can have a bit of ping pong. Um, I couldn't find any solid means of, of avoiding that. It's just too horrific. Um, another fun point is we need to migrate from the idle task. So currently on load balancing, we try and avoid migrating current because current is on the CPU. If you try to take that off, it's obviously icky. So what we do is we use the stopper task, which is the highest priority task in the system. We schedule to that, and that means that our previous current is no current anymore, and then we can move it, and then we switch back and, and all that. Um, I did not want to use the stopper task because all we really need is to schedule again, because this is all inside schedule. So I switched to the idle task, but I already said it that we need to reschedule. So we schedule to idle and we immediately schedule out, but that's enough. But that means current is not current anymore. Um, because otherwise this happens. So this took me a wee bit to figure out how that happened. But yeah, so we block and we try and pick one and we find B, which is owned here, and we try and migrate ourselves to here. We can take ourselves off the run queue, that's okay. We can enqueue ourselves here. We can reschedule the other CPU, and we can pick A and switch to A, and boom, because now A is running on two CPUs at the same time. It is a fairly difficult race to make happen, but if it does, it leaves you in very, very funny water. So yeah, that wasn't good. Um, this is why before we take A off, we first switch to the idle thread and have this redo the schedule, which is redo the walk, and then you can migrate whatever task you do find because it's not current anymore. Um, 
So, okay, now we've talked about moving tasks towards somebody that might have something to run. Um, this also means you need to undo this when you start running again. And that is tricky as well. I mean, wouldn't it? Uh, um, so and this is actually the situation um, where we end up with owner is us. Um, so CPU1 uh, does a reschedule and it does a proxy and it does the iteration. CPU0 does an unlock and it assigns the owner to us. Um, since it did an unlock, it needs to do a wake up of the owner, but the wake up will need to take the run queue lock. But this CPU, CPU1, already owns the run queue lock because it's in the middle of schedule. So here, the wake up is waiting, is stuck. Um, so this is why we need to finish the wake up and then run, except that if owner is on a CPU, say it has a strict affinity to CPU zero, we can't actually run it here, nor can we migrate it. So, so what we do in this case is instead of finishing the wake up, we put it back to sleep and then we uh, return zero, it says, this proxy run, I failed, retry. Then this one will continue with the wake up, see a sleeping task and says, oi, I need to move you over. And it works again. Um, this turns out that in all the cases that I've found so far seems to work because in all cases, a pending wake up is happening. Either you're doing it from the wake up path, in which case you fail your first wake up and then continue to a second wake up that works, or you have this funny case where a wake up is waiting on another CPU, which then will fix up state. Um, it's all a bit iffy, but it seems to work. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it, I think. I have patches, and, and then the, the PISA guys asked for it. I've not had done a lot of work on it, so I've not posted them yet. Um, but like I said, it boots, and it's got a whole heap of tricky in, um, and there's some few unresolved issues, um, but it's fun playing with. Yeah, so another... Why would you like migrate disabled? I can do that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, so Steve asked why I don't like my great disable. Which was the original title of this talk? Because I don't know. Um, it artificially limits concurrency. Um, you end up in the situations where you have four runnable tasks, all stuck to CPU zero, and three idle CPUs. Um, this is a difficult situation because people don't expect it. Um, and from a design point of view, it's also not ideal um, because the reason you do migrate disable is to use per CPU memory. But if you're schedulable, if you're preemptible and you're using per CPU memory, you already need locks for your data anyway. Because you're sharing that per CPU data between these four tasks that are all stuck to the CPU zero. So you're not actually avoiding locks you're limiting concurrency, um, and I don't really see a benefit. So you're saying everyone who's using per CPU variables should be So saying everyone who is using per CPU variables should be using spin logs in the first place? Most of the code actually does. No, it doesn't. A lot of does preempt so, disable. So currently, you do preempt disable, and then you know this per CPU data is me because there ain't nobody else, except for the few cases which use it from interrupt, but then they know the data is only used from interrupt context or they already use a lock or, or some lockless data structure. But basically most per CPU stuff, like for example the memory allocators and all that, they disable interrupts or disable preemption and then know this per CPU memory is just for me. We don't need logs, there isn't anybody else. 
And this makes sense. And this is okay. But because of RT and how it changes some assumptions, like for example the spin locks, which on mainline disable preemption, and therefore also disable migration, and therefore implicitly allow use of per CPU memory, we need to do this. But it is, if you allow preemption while using per CPU memory, you need locks. And at that point, the use of per CPU state is of dubious value. Yeah, I mean, I know it's all my fault. I came up with that. Well, I mean, you have so, to use. No, the problem is that I, I didn't find an, uh, a sane way to deal with the, the whole per CPU uh, memory uh, frenzy, which was breaking out uh, around the 3.0 time frame. Yeah, so you did the local lock, like, right? Yeah, but yeah, the local locks is a, is a, is a, is a, is a related thing, but uh, they all rely on the thing, on the, on the fact that you're preemptible and can access this CPU memory, because that's how the code is written. Right, and, and doing it from a small and bounded preempt disable region is the best and sane thing to do. Yeah, the problem is, is that mainline is not sane. It has very long and unbounded preempt disable regions. This is why we need to break up the spin locks in the first place. Um, if yeah, we which, were to... Which then, which then resulted in everybody assuming it's safe to do this CPU access inside the spin lock regions because mainline gives you that guarantee. Yeah, and so then... Now, now you break... You, you break the, the preemptability and you're... Yeah, so mainline build a house of cards and we're tearing cards out from under, see what happens. So yeah, we, we, we need this for RT and it's a bit of a, but it's, it's an ugly hack. So, so Sebastian, uh, no, 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 Big Easy, um, asked me, why can't we do this in mainline? Can we do preempt disable into mainline? And, and, and we've had this discussion a number of years ago and I think the slab guys started it. Um, and I said no then, and I say no now, because we already have people using two large non-preemptible regions. If you give them this, it'll only get far, far worse, and they'll, they'll slap it on everything and anything. Um, Basically, what you're saying is use migrate, or migrate disable is only for... It's, 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 a, it's a patch for RT, because mainline relies on semantics that are implicit. I guess the rule is uh, migrate disable can only be used with conjunction, conjunction with a lock. Yeah. So basically, and, and in RT it is right. And if we ever do bring it to mainline, it's it's only going to be it will only come with the local lock uh, information. Or, but, and then, but only for that. I mean, um, and then but the thing is, you have to watch out for you know those driver writers that, you know, we just had to talk about how they're using, you know, Julia, I think, was just one showing that drivers like to use raw spin locks and such like that. You're driver people, writers are like user space people. They have right. no friggin' clue. Right, so um, they'll probably start using migrate disable, so we'll have to have, like, a, some sort of uh, feature that migrate disable cannot be used outside of, uh, I mean, a lock and have, like, so, linker so, tricks Yeah, so one errors. thing, if, if we want to go mop up and avoid the entire migrate disable thing, um, and this is fixing a lot of code, is, is building a detector, and you can use LockDap or whatever, that if per CPU data is used outside of an explicit um, IRQ disable, preempt disable, or raw spin lock, um, it'll yell. And then it does we... Already. It does already. No. It, because currently on mainline, spin lock also disables preemption, and you can use per CPU memory under spin lock, but the spin right. lock changes to a mutex and introduces all this preemptibility. Also, I think RT still has the local IRQ disable no RT. Right. Those would also need to yell, and the preempt disable no RT would also need to yell. So if you would make per CPU accesses yell under the stricter conditions of RT, or outside of the stricter conditions of RT, and then fix up all the per CPU usage. That would be best. I guess what we need to do is have a way of adding two preempt disables, one that, um, like a special one that Spinlock uses, 
uh, that doesn't flag locked up. That basically, so when locked, so it locked up ignores the preempt disable for anything that's done by spin lock. Right, but well, that's not too hard. I mean, locked up knows or can be taught to know uh, the lock types. Um, actually, Thomas and me just talked about a patch that validates things, um, lock nesting. Um, currently, mainline, you can nest a spin lock inside of a raw spin lock and nobody complains. It'll just work. It's obviously a problem as soon as you start doing RT because then the uh, a regular spin lock will become a mutex and this does not work if you're holding a raw spin lock, which is still a spin lock uh, and all that. Um, so in 14, I posted a patch for locked up to, to check this. Um, it never went anywhere near because the core x86 interrupt stuff had a, valid, uh, a violation of this. And at the time, we couldn't fix it. But Thomas has just rewritten everything there. So it might just work now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is why I don't like migrate disable. There's no upsides. It just... A long migrate disable. So yeah, it's... It, it is a stopgap to guarantee the things mainline now does. I mean, I was looking into something else recently, whether we could do something magic with the whole uh, pure CPU access stuff for RT. I mean, if we hold a lock and say this is for this particular CPU uh, that we basically get some magic. I think, uh, we, I think we talked about this before. Um, yeah, we did. It's an extension of the local lock. Use local lock and on RT make it an actual proper lock and, and relax all the... Um, I think we can actually make that happen. No, no, the the thing that I was thinking about, not, not uh, replay, uh, getting rid of, of, of microite disable completely and change the implementation of this CPU bar and all this uh, fancy stuff we have, uh, by saying under RT, if you take the lock, you store uh, the information which CPU bars you or which CPU you are targeting with this CPU access, and then as long you hold as you hold the lock, you can be scheduled to some uh, uh, migrated to some other place, but you still reference no, the right. I, we played with this, I think. Um. It went up in flames at some point, but yeah, um, of course. Uh, yeah, this this should work in theory. Um, it's it's just as long as you have a proper look around it, it's just any old data. Um, yeah. So yeah. It's just it's just the the, the this CPU maze which uh, blocks you from actually doing it. But we could hide all the nastiness in there. Maybe. It's ugly enough already, so. It is. Although I've not seen the very latest versions. I've not looked at RT in a while. Um, any other questions while I'm here? No? OK, so, so there is more icky in the patch that, that I've not talked about yet. Um, one of the things is all those tasks that are blocked on a mutex, um, and are still on a run queue, um, are exempted from load balancing for obvious reasons. Um, the way I'm currently doing that is, is really icky, um, mostly because of the RT classes, which have the pushable and non-pushable lists. Um, so when the scheduler finds it, it actually dequeues and requeues those tasks, which is fairly heavyweight um, just to update those push lists. But it's, um, it's the easy way to exclude them from load balancing. Because if you're also going to add load balancing that randomly moves these non-runnable tasks around, uh, that's, just, just, that's just pain. Um, yeah, that was a very qu quick thing to do for me. Um, so I can also talk about why inheriting nice values is wrong in case anybody's interested. Um, if you look at what this, or what proxy execution ends up doing for, for a, a, a weighted fair queuing algorithm, 
which is what CFS basically is, um, you'll see is that it is adding all the weight from the entire blockchain. So it's a sum of weights, and it's not just the uh, heaviest weight or whatever you have that ends up being the inherited quality. So all the tasks that are blocked pull their weight together to make the owner run faster, run more, run quicker. Um, for this, with um, C group scheduling, um, you n indeed need to keep these things on the run queue. So I, I did a very ugly patch for the Android guys a whole bunch of time ago that would emulate this. But the problem is if with a regular mutex, you block, you take the task off, the, the run queues uh, the, from the C groups are also taken off and the entire weight distribution of the system changes. So the sum of the block queue is incalculable. <laughs> so you just wing it. Um, <laughs> so here the, the quality of the block task actually remaining on the run queue and, and being persistent in the system um, helps to make the, the sum doable. Because if you take him out, the sums change. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why what Android is doing is absolute bonkers. All right. Um, how, is that, how is that screwing with accounting? Hmm? How is that going to screw with the whole CPU accounting? Is it keeping the tasks on the run queue? Um, it'll change a bit, but I doubt anybody will notice. Of course, somebody will, and we'll complain, and we'll just tell them to stuff it. Um, so ideally, tasks won't block, and they'll stay runnable indefinitely. Um, and this is your upper bound on load. You'll basically be stuck at the upper bound. The, the actual block time will disappear from load calculations. I don't know. If, if you have significant block time in your system to see it in your load averages, you're doing it wrong anyway, right? Right. So, um, yeah, I don't care. Uh, yeah, I was assuming that do don't, you don't care, but uh, I was just asking whether there is... Some, uh, so, oh, somebody or will care. count as lurking around. I mean, the, 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 the CPU... I mean, uh, Brendan Gregg recently did an entire blog post, and that's a very good read on, on the CPU, or on the system load averages and on how on Linux this is different from all the other Unixes. Because people get really upset about this. <laughs> it, it, just seriously, people get worked up over it. And it's, and then this is in the comment on the CPU load average .c file that we have in the scheduler. This is a dumb number because people care. It really is, it's just a magic number. But people get really, really worked up over it for some odd reason, I, I can't find them. But, um, <laughs> it's just one of those things. Because um, in an age where we have 200, 400, 600 CPUs in a system, we care about one global number. Yeah, I think not. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing like with uh, top. If you, if you run RT and then suddenly all your interrupt threads and soft IRQ threads Our get accounted. Time. And yep. RT consumes 50% more CPU time than your mainline kernel. Yeah, so if you ask the person to add thread IRQs to the, kernel, uh, the mainline kernel command line, suddenly the mainline kernel eats in the exactly the same amount of CPU. So we have an option for interrupt accounting using TSC timestamps yeah, on interrupt exit and exit, and that, that does some of it, but it's not as visible because we don't feed that through the hard interrupt reporting magic number in, because that's difficult. Um, other architectures like I think S390 and maybe Power actually do do this. They have the fine-grained accounting from day one, so for them it's not a loss in performance, but um, yeah, who cares? I'm way too quick, ain't I? Oh, no. Yep, you're good. Hooray. Well, food, people. 
Thank you, Peter.